The title of our sermon this morning is God is King. God is King. The primary text, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. And this morning, in our ongoing series now entitled The Essentials, we come to the subject of God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. Our aim in this series is one sermon, one hour, one fundamental or foundational subject. These sermons, I pray, will serve as helpful introductions to those subjects that we believe to be essential in the growth and development, maturity of someone new to the faith or someone new to our church. However, I also pray that these sermons devoted to these foundational or fundamental subjects will serve as helpful reminders for those more familiar with our theology, for more, those more familiar with our church and our practice here. And it has been a tremendous blessing to my heart to be able to consider these subjects afresh with you. And I pray it'll stir you up by way of reminder as well uh, that we serve a great God and he is worthy, worthy of our worship and praise. Amen. Now we are loosely following the general course of our confession of faith in this series, the second London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689. And so we began our series on the essentials with the doctrine of revelation. We have subsequently been working through theology proper or the doctrine of God. And this week we come to the subject or the theme in the Bible of God's sovereignty. In the time that we have together this morning, we're going to hear a sermon about free and glorious grace. The free and glorious grace of God. And the world at large, including most of the professing church, would absolutely hate it. <laughs> No doctrine appears to be more despised by the natural man than the biblical truth that God is absolutely sovereign over all things, including salvation. Human pride has a death grip on the natural disposition of the human heart. And in pride, the natural man revolts against every notion that God has decreed all things, has created all things, orders all things, sustains all things, controls all things, and rules all things. God freely works all things after the counsel of his own perfect and immutable and inviolable will. And with a prideful death grip on his own supposed freedom... On his own supposed autonomy, the natural or carnal man gnashes his teeth most at the biblical truth that God is absolutely sovereign over all things, including salvation. He abhors God's determined choice that it is settled in heaven before the foundation of the earth was ever laid. He despises that the potter does in fact have freedom and power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor. In Luke chapter 4, highlighting or exemplifying this abhorrence of his doctrine, in Luke chapter 4, the Lord is preaching in Nazareth, where the subject of God's sovereignty came up in one of his sermons there, one of his earliest sermons in the Gospels, in Nazareth in the synagogue. The subject of his free and sovereign choice came up, beginning in verse 25 there, Luke records, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath, a Gentile, in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And then there were many lepers who were in Israel in the time of Elijah the prophet. And none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian, another Gentile. Now, in other words, what the Lord is highlighting here in Luke chapter 4, verse 25, is that God's grace, God's sovereign election, God's sovereign free choice is not limited by their ethnicity or them being Jews. It's not limited by their claim to be descendants of Abraham. His free sovereign will bore no claim to his grace on their part. God didn't owe them anything. They didn't have some special claim to God's grace because of who they had descended from or who they were, who their ethnicity, what their ethnicity was. Their external religiosity earned them nothing. 
And God would extend his grace even to the Gentiles. In other words, God is sovereign over salvation. Now, how do they respond to this account in Luke chapter 4, verse 28 then? So all those in the synagogue, these are religious people, quote unquote, right? So those are religious people. In our day, these would be uh, folks sitting in churches all over this country right now, presuming to worship God. If the Lord were to walk in, preach the same sermon, they might react similarly. <laughs> Verse 28, all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, they were filled with wrath. How many times have you been witnessing to someone, talking to someone, you begin explaining God's sovereignty, and all of a sudden... They become filled with wrath, wrath, with hostility, with defensiveness, right? They were filled with wrath. Verse 29, they rose up and thrust him out of the city. They led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. They were going to kill him during his first sermon in Nazareth. Why? Because he asserted the free sovereign, electing, determined will of God Almighty. Shortly after, shortly after, recorded in John chapter 6, the Lord again is preaching to the masses that followed him to Capernaum this time after the feeding of the 5,000, where the Lord multiplied the bread and the fish. Jesus says to them, don't labor for the bread which perishes. Your fathers ate bread, bread which came down from heaven. They ate that bread in the wilderness, and they are dead, the Lord explained to them. Jesus says, I am the living bread. Partake of me. Find life in me. Figuratively, eat of my blood, drink of my, or eat of my flesh, drink of my blood. Right? Partake of me. Find life in me. And then he said this in verse 65, no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. And in verse 66, what was the response? Verse 66, from that time, and upon those hard words, many of his disciples went back and followed him no more. The prideful, self-entitled, carnal man, dead in his sin, enslaved to his lusts, entrenched in his, rebellion, in his rebellion, rises up, clenches his fists, grits his teeth, and shouts, that's not fair. <laughs> that's not fair. <laughs> I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Paul asks in Romans chapter 9, verse 14, what are you saying then? What are you saying? Is there unrighteousness with God? Right, that's not fair. Are you asserting that there is unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. Paul asserts there is no unrighteousness with God. Why? Verse 15, there in Romans chapter 9, because God says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. In other words, God's mercy... God's compassion based entirely, entirely on God's own sovereign choice. So then, Paul continues, it, the granting of God's mercy, right? So then, God granting mercy is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs. In other words, it's not based on human decision. It's not based on human effort. It is based on God, there in verse 16, who shows mercy. God is sovereign over all things, including salvation. It's generally at this point that the natural man gets most uncomfortable. <laughs> and upon hearing this, we could read those texts in their bare form straight out of the Bible. And professing Christians would get uncomfortable. He begins to rationalize other options. Well, it can't mean that. He rebels against this perceived violation of his own fallen reason. He assumes a defensive posture. He has an emotional reaction. And he gives an offensive response. It all begins 
with fallen man, attempting to discern the ways and workings of our inscrutable God in a way that satisfies his own sense of what seems right to him. His little, tiny, created brain defying the sovereign rule of his creator. Well, as we said regarding God's divine providence, the scriptures are clear, the scriptures are unvarnished, They are unflinching, unapologetic. The Bible does not mince words. The word of God is unequivocal. This is not shadowy or doubtful or up for debate. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. He is in sovereign control. As the king of all creation, God is working all things according to the counsel of his own decreed or immutable or unchangeable will. Now think with me for a moment when we make assertions like that from the word of God. If anything happens outside the decreed will of God, then it is happening outside the sovereignty of God. Let's understand what we're talking about. God, the Bible says, decrees, foreordains all things whatsoever that come to pass. If anything happens outside of God's decreed will, then it happens outside the sovereignty of God. And if anything happens outside of the sovereignty of God, then that simply means that God is not sovereign. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean or imply that God is directly and immediately, personally working on the planet everything that actually happens. He doesn't have his hands, so to speak, in everything that happens as if he were directly, immediately working to bring that thing to pass. Sin exists, for example, Right? And God does not sin. So God's not immediately working sin in the creature. But what it does mean is that God is sovereign over all things that do happen, including sin. He ordains it. And by his, we've used these terms before, a permissive will or efficacious will, by his permissive will allows it. It comes to pass according to his effective working or it comes to pass by his allowance. He has decreed to let it happen. Doesn't mean that he commends it. Doesn't mean that he approves it. But God certainly ordains it, decrees it. Therefore, his sovereign control then extends to all things. Extends to all things. Extends to nature to nations, even the decisions and actions of men, as we said last week, from the smallest of microscopic particles to the largest of galaxies and the expanse of this universe, God foreordains all things, including the sovereign determination of who will be saved. This is the doctrine of God's sovereignty. If God is not sovereign, then God is not God. Do you see? Well, many would say, listen, we all agree that God is sovereign, right? Arminian, Calvinist, we would all say that God is sovereign. We would all say that God works all things after the counsel of his own will. But it's how, they would say, it's how God applies his sovereignty that differs. Or how God applies his sovereignty that matters. He applies his sovereignty in some cases, And he doesn't apply his sovereignty in other cases. That's a bunch of hogwash. That is rationalization. That's defense. That's something that can't be found in the Bible. You can't use that. You can't find that in Scripture to defend that worthless position. It doesn't exist in the Bible. This is the God who works how many things? All things. How many things does all things include? I think all things includes all. All things. God works all things after the counsel of whose will? Your will? What's going to happen down the road? He looks down the corridor of time. He sees what you, you autonomous creature, you, are going to decide in your little pea brain. And he says, based upon your decision, I'm going to do this, that, or the other thing. No. God works all things after the counsel of his will. If God is not sovereign, God is not God. When we begin to consider this doctrine, 
Frankly, when we begin to consider any doctrine from the Word of God, but particularly a doctrine like this, it's important to first concern ourselves with the disposition of our own hearts. When you speak with someone, I'd encourage you to have this kind of a conversation with them before you speak. When you come to doctrine in the Word of God, I would encourage you, exhort you from the Word of God, that we should come to the Word of God with this disposition of heart that we're about to describe, right? We are in the position of learner, learning disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be taught. We need to understand. We need the Spirit of God to guide us. We need the revealed Word of God to understand, right? And we need to be willing to follow the Word of God wherever it leads, it's exceedingly necessary when considering a subject like this that we consider the disposition of our own heart. Jeremiah reminds us that the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately weak. That means that you have a deceiving enemy within your own breast. <laughs> we know that our heart is self-justifying. We are prone to prideful, emotional responses. We're often given to defending a case rather than seeking the truth. Right? Somebody says something and why don't immediately, our, the first response out of our flesh is to defend ourselves and to fight for what we think we know, think we believe. It's the first response out of our sinful flesh. All of this will get in the way of Christian maturity. You will stunt your own growth if you approach the word of God in that kind of ignorance. Be humble. Be teachable. Right, let me give you three characteristics of a humble and teachable heart. This is going to be crucial for considering this subject today that we'll consider in a, in a general sense, but it's also going to be critical for the sermons that follow when we get to predestination, unconditional election. Let me give you three characteristics of a humble and teachable heart. One, you have to approach the task of learning the Word of God in faith. Approach study of the Word of God in faith. Approach learning the Word of God in faith. Approach the revealed Word of God in faith. Trust the Lord with what he has clearly revealed. Labor, expend great effort to apprehend all that he has revealed. We need his word. Amen? And the, the more that I study, the more that I read, the more sense of desperation I feel for how much more I need to study and read. The more that I think I know, the more I realize I don't know. We need the word of God. Thomas Watson describes some truth in the Word of God as not against reason, but above reason. There's nothing in the Word of God that is presented in the Word of God that is unreasonable or irrational. Our God is alone wise and all wise, right? There's nothing there unreasonable or irrational. Thomas Watson describes some truths in the Bible as standing above reason, transcending reason, outside reason. In other words, our little brains don't have the capacity to understand or God has not revealed that to us. Those things which are hidden are for God. Those things revealed are for us and our children, okay? There are many truths that very well may be demonstrated by reason, that doesn't mean that we approach the Bible with a cold-hearted rationalism or that we approach the Bible subjecting the text to our own rational, rationalism or our own logic, our own reason. We cannot subject incomprehensible omniscience to man's feeble capacity to understand. The problem, in other words, the problem lies not with the revealed word. The problem lies with the creature that it is revealed to, right? Our own limits. Revealed truth is never against reason, but often revealed truth is above or transcends reason. Watson then says this. I think this is helpful. Watson then says, where reason cannot wade, there faith may swim. In other words, where reason couldn't get the tip of its big toe in that pond, faith can swim around in there, swim around in the depths of the ocean of God's revelation, and worship and praise God as a result of it, it can swim there where reason cannot even wade. 
We must walk according to what is revealed. And we must walk according to all that is revealed. And we must trust the Lord for where that leads us. Approach the task in faith. Two, this effort must always be in dependence upon the Holy Spirit. This effort must always be in dependence on the Holy Spirit. One of the reasons this effort to understand, study, learn, apprehend the revealed Word of God, one of the reasons that this effort is undertaken in faith is because we need the Spirit of God to convict us, to humble us, to teach us, to guide us, to help us understand. The Spirit of God is the one who leads, right? He's the one who reveals. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. These things God has revealed to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. We need Him to grant us by His grace the capacity to understand. We need Him to grant us by His grace the faith to trust in His Word. We need to ask for that help every time we come to read his word. Whenever you sit down to read, whenever you sit down to study, pray. Ask for the Spirit's help. Ask for the Spirit's guidance, right? And approach the word of God in faith, in dependence upon the Holy Spirit. Third, third, you must be ready and willing then to follow wherever the revealed word of God leads. We approach the task in faith, we approach the task in dependence upon the Holy Spirit, and then the disposition of our heart should be that we are ready and willing to follow the Word of God wherever the revealed Word of God leads us, even and especially when it leads us somewhere where we don't expect, didn't see coming. You can think of it this way. Think of it this way. You, in this effort, in this journey, you step out onto a path that is illuminated by the word of God. A path in front of you, in front of your feet, that is illuminated by the word of God. We have uh, credence for that in scripture, don't we? Your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light to my path. So you step out onto this illuminated path, right? It's illuminated by the word of God. As the pathway, as you begin to walk, the pathway is lit up before you. And so you follow the lit path and you keep walking. You keep walking, just keep walking, just keep walking. <laughs> Sometimes faster, sometimes you walk a little more slowly, but you're always walking in what the Word of God has revealed as the path before you is illuminated, right? Sometimes you walk into a room and the whole room lights up, right? The whole room lights up. Amazing truth that God has revealed in His Word. You'll come back to that room over and over and over again, finding more and more Stuff in there that's lit up by the Word of God. You're going to see more and more revealed by greater and greater light that is given the longer that you walk around that room with the Lord. Sometimes you walk into an area, lights come on, and fireworks go off. God's sovereignty was that experience for me. <laughs> I remember walking into that room. The lights came on. It, seemingly, they came on in an instant. I'm like, wait a minute. I've seen this everywhere in the Bible. How could I have missed that? And fireworks go off, right? At other, at other times, the pathway may be dim. Pathway may be dim, hard to discern, difficult to see, but you have to keep walking along the path, working along the path until the Lord gives more and more light. We always, in this path, in this walk, we always need guides the Lord is gracious to give us guides. We can't just walk the path in our own wisdom, thinking we can figure all this out ourselves. Listen, this is the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, plural. It's been given to the church. You've been delivered to the church, right? You learn in community. We learn these things in community. We all need guides. We all need help. So if you think to yourself that you're going to lock yourself in the darkness of your own closet, sit down with your Bible and figure all this out, you're going to come out a heretic. That's, what, that's where heretics come from, okay? We need guides. At other times along the path, there may be obstacles that you encounter. Big rocks of pride. Walls of obstinacy. Sometimes with reinforced concrete. Quicksand of apathy. The fog of ignorance or neglect. The cement 
of traditionalism. You're going to walk along the path and you're going to find obstacles there. Disputes over doubtful things, contentions, strivings about the law, temptation to speculation, temptations to controversy. You simply cannot go off the path into the dark. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. They remain shrouded in darkness. But those things which are revealed, those things along the lit path that the Word of God directs us to, they belong to us and our children forever. When you get off the path, we say to the law, and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Do you see? But in all your effort, after learning the word of God or walking along the path all this time, you must be willing to follow wherever the word of God leads. Wherever revelation leads, we must be willing to follow, even and especially when it leads you somewhere you did not expect. You can't open a door to a lit room and then slam it shut and refuse to walk in there because it offends you. I don't like that wall, that room. I'm not going to deal with that room. I feel comfortable with these rooms over here. No, no, no. If God's word has revealed it, I'll walk in there, figure that out. You can't proof your text, proof text your way along a preconceived path these are the things I believe. I've got these four verses that prove it to me. And I'm going to stay along the path that is beaten and worn that feels comfortable to me. Can't do that. Can't neglect other passages. Selecting some, neglecting others. You must apply what theologians have called the analogy of the faith. Taking all relevant scripture into account. Walking into every room. You must approach the task in faith. You must expend great effort in dependence upon the Spirit of God as you do, and you must be willing to follow wherever He leads. That's reasonable, isn't it? There's nothing irrational or unreasonable about that. That's how we should approach the Word of God when we come to any subject in the Bible, but particularly subjects like this that tend to, that our fallen, prideful hearts and minds tend to bristle against. So then, ready and willing to follow his word where it leads us, taking his hand, as it were, by faith, relying on the Spirit of God for understanding, let's go to the text. We'll begin by addressing the sovereignty of God in a more general term, in more general terms today, and we'll look at more specific aspects of his sovereignty related to predestination and election in future sermons. This general subject of God's sovereignty is found throughout the Bible, cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation, the very marrow, you could say, of biblical revelation is God's sovereignty. It's all over the Bible. There are many texts from which we may learn much about this subject, and we're merely going to scratch the surface this morning. And scratching the surface, the surface, though, let's go to a key text in the Old Testament. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. As you're turning to Daniel chapter 4, the southern kingdom of Judah, Daniel among them, has been taken captive. They've been exiled under the powerful king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar believes himself to be sovereign. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar believes himself to be the king of kings, the lord of lords. He believes that it has been the power of his own might that has secured him the great kingdom that stretched out before him. So much so that in Daniel chapter 4, verse 30, the king spoke saying, Is this not great Babylon? that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty. And any biblical thinking, God-fearing person would have fled for their lives expecting at any moment that lightning would strike after those words came out of his mouth. Or at the very least that he'd be eaten by worms, right? Like Herod. Look at verse 1. Daniel chapter 4, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king to all peoples, 
nations, and languages. In other words, this is something that Nebuchadnezzar wanted to declare to everyone. He wants everyone to know. Now, it's amazing what he's about to declare, considering that Nebuchadnezzar is the pagan king of Babylon. Right? But listen to what Nebuchadnezzar says. To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are His signs. How mighty are His wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. <clears throat> His dominion is from generation to generation. Now, these are the words of Nebuchadnezzar. These are the words of Nebuchadnezzar while he had a clear-headed understanding of God's sovereignty. In his right mind, he understood God's sovereignty and we'll see by his own testimony that that wasn't always the case. It wasn't always the case that Nebuchadnezzar saw things this way. Nebuchadnezzar was about to get an object lesson from God himself concerning who is sovereign and who is not. Okay? Verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house, flourishing in my palace. And I saw a dream which made me afraid. And the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore... I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Now, they bring him in and Nebuchadnezzar's own wise guys couldn't interpret the dream. So they brought in eventually Daniel. Daniel, known to be wise, was brought in. Daniel, who was known to be able to interpret dreams. And Daniel hears the dream from Nebuchadnezzar in preparation to interpret it. Essentially, a tree grows in the midst of the earth. That's verses 10 through 12. A holy one comes down out of heaven and cries in verse 14. Look at verse 14 with me. Chop down the tree. Cut off its branches. Strip off its leaves. Scatter its fruit. Let the beasts get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze. In the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him graze with the beasts on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast, and let seven times pass over him. Now this is a description. What you find here is a description of what God would soon do to humble Nebuchadnezzar and to teach him a very important lesson what is the lesson going to be about? It's a lesson about the sovereignty of Almighty God. Now here's the lesson, verse 17. This decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones. In order that, it has a purpose. The dream has an intention. This decree has a purpose. It's in order that the living all living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whomever He will, and sets over it the lowest of men. Now the decision, the decision, the sentence is in order that it's for the purpose that all men, the living, all people may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whomever, whomever He, God, He gives it, to whomever he will. And he sets over it the lowest of men. The word there in verse 17, rules, is actually a noun in the Hebrew. It serves as an adjective, an adjective to describe God, meaning that the Most High is ruler, right? Literally, sovereign. The Most High, sovereign in the kingdoms of men. Sovereign among men. By implication, then, you, Nebuchadnezzar, are not. The Most High is sovereign. You, Nebuchadnezzar, are not. And no one else is. No one else is. The Most High God establishes kings. The Most High God establishes kingdoms. And he determines all of this in his own will. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1. Even the king's heart. Even the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and like rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Of course now, as we follow the, the account, all takes place exactly as the Lord had said that it would. Nebuchadnezzar 
He was walking around his palace one evening. His heart lifted up in abhorrent, absurd pride. Not in his right mind. That very hour, as the words were coming out of his mouth, look at what my great strength has, right? As the words were coming out of his mouth, he was driven from among men, lost his mind, and put out in the field eating grass like an ox. When the time had passed then, Nebuchadnezzar, by the grace of God, returned to his senses. Nebuchadnezzar learned his lesson. We find his confession then, verse 34. Drop down to verse 34 with me. At the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High. He understands who is Most High. I blessed the Most High, praised and honored Him who lives forever. For His dominion, that word literally means sovereignty or rule. His sovereignty, right? For His sovereignty is an everlasting sovereignty, and His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to His will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? Answer me this, Nebuchadnezzar. Let me put to you a question. Answer me this, Nebuchadnezzar. When God reaches forth his hand to do something, in other words, when God sovereignly decrees whatsoever that shall come to pass, And then he works in his providence to execute his decree in sovereign power. Who is there who can stop him? No one. God is sovereign. No one stops God's hand. God accomplishes all things that he decrees. And what does God decree? All things. Who is there to whom God must give an account? Is he accountable to you? No, he is accountable to no one and no thing, no one and nobody. He does according to all his will. This is the doctrine of God's sovereignty, right? The doctrine of God's sovereignty. This lost, pagan, idolatrous Babylonian came to his senses understanding what most professing Christians today despise and reject. And this is a lost, pagan, idolatrous, wicked Babylonian. What should this lead then, Nebuchadnezzar? And what should this lead us to do? How do we respond to this? We respond in awe. We respond in wonder. We respond in worship and in praise and in devotion and in trust. We respond in faith. We respond in following after him. We respond in obedience. We sang the hymn earlier. Sing it with me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth. We could sing, right, sovereignly he leadeth me, right, for his faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he That's right. His faithful follower I will be because... It's by his sovereign hand that he leadeth me. That's how we respond. We respond in faith. We respond in obedience to his sovereign rule over us. We respond in trust. We respond in devotion. We respond in worship and praise. Turn with me to Isaiah. Back a couple of books. Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10. Beautiful example. Many, 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 many examples in the Bible of God's sovereignty. Look at Isaiah chapter 10. Look with me beginning at verse 5. In Isaiah chapter 10, verse 5, through the prophet, God proclaims a woe, his wrath against Assyria. Now listen in verse 5. 
Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. Now, how does God refer to Assyria in verse 5? This pagan nation, this enemy of Israel, is the rod of God's anger. They are his instrumental means, right? They are a secondary cause, you could say. They are a means of God's anger. In other words, God is sovereign over Assyria. Do you see? Verse 6, what is God going to do with Assyria? He says in verse 6, I will send him against an ungodly nation. That nation is Israel. God's own people here described as ungodly. I will send him against an ungodly nation and against the people of my wrath. I will give him charge. Why? Because God is sovereign. God is sovereign. He will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take prey, to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Who is sending Assyria in verse 6? God, sovereign God is sending Assyria. What is God specifically going to do to Israel through the instrumental means of Assyria? Seize spoil, take prey, and tread them down. God is sovereign, do you see? Here, what is on astonishing and staggering display is the sovereignty of God over his creation. Okay? Look at verse 7. Yet he, who's the he? The he there is Assyria. Yet he, yet Assyria, does not mean so. <laughs> Fascinating, isn't it? Nor does his heart think so. But it is in his heart to destroy and cut off not a few nations. He's going to cut off many nations. In Assyria's heart is to destroy and to cut off many nations. Okay? They don't intend from the heart here to do the work of God. They don't intend here to be the instrumental means of God to judge Israel. They aren't setting out to obey God. They're not even setting out to consider God in any way, shape, form, or fashion, right? But what is in their heart to do, God purposes, intends, determines, and means to accomplish his decreed end. He tasks them to do all his will. The judgment of his rebellious people, Israel. Assyria is going to be used to judge Israel. Assyria had their intentions, God had decreed his intentions, and it's God's will that comes to pass. This is the sovereignty of God. Now notice in verse 5, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 5, who is the judgment actually proclaimed about at the beginning of verse 5? It's actually proclaimed against Assyria. We've just heard about how God is going to use Assyria to judge Israel but the woe, the wrath of Elohim, so to speak, is determined against Assyria. Now, how, what is going on? God is going to use Assyria, the intentions of their heart, to bring judgment against his people Israel. And then God in sovereignty is going to use that as the instrumental means by which he judges Assyria for their wickedness and their sin against his people. God is sovereign. God proclaims a woe against Assyria. God, sovereign over all things, decreeing all things whatsoever that come to pass, intends to judge Assyria for their free, immoral, and wicked actions against his people Israel. At the very same time that he sovereignly intended Assyria's free, though immoral and wicked actions, as a judgment against Israel. It's fascinating, isn't it? This is the doctrine of God's sovereignty. Look at verse 12. Verse 12, Therefore, it shall come to pass when the Lord has performed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem that he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty looks. Now why is God intending to punish Assyria like this? Because Assyria rejects God's sovereignty. Look at verse 13. Because, or for, he says, Assyria says, by the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom I am prudent. Who does that sound like? Sounds like Nebuchadnezzar, doesn't it? Also I have removed the boundaries of the people, I've robbed their treasuries, so I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. Look at the swelling pride of wicked Assyria. Right? Assyria, rejecting God's sovereignty, God will turn and judge Assyria. Verse 14, my hand 
has found like a nest the riches of the people and one gathers eggs that are left. I have gathered all the earth. There was no one who moved his wing nor opened his mouth with even a peep. In other words, Assyria's got his thumbs under his overall straps and he's saying, look at all I've done. They couldn't even lift a finger against me. And he forgets the Most High who rules among the kingdoms of men. So then, God points out the absurdity of thinking that we are in control of anything. He points out the absurdity of Assyria's pride, saying in verse 15, Shall the axe boast itself against him who chops with it? Fascinating, isn't it? Shall the saw exalt itself against him who saws with it? As if a rod could wield itself against those who lift it up, or as if a staff could lift up as if it were not wood. <laughs> now think with me, all of these tools, right? The axe, the saw, the rod, the staff, all instruments in the hands of another. All instruments here in the hands of God. The people of Assyria act freely and they act wickedly. God is just and God is righteous when he executes judgment against Israel for their idolatry. And God is just and God is righteous when he executes judgment against Assyria for her wicked actions. Assyria acts in accord with their own intentions and yet it is the Lord's decreed purpose that in, in every way is fulfilled. And what we find out is that Assyria is no different than an axe, a saw, a rod, or a staff that God can pick up and wield as he sees fit. And for that matter, Israel is absolutely no different. And for that matter, neither are you and neither am I. <laughs> right? Will the thing formed Say to the one who formed it, why have you made me this way? The absurdity of it all, right? As if the lump of clay is going to complain against the potter. It's foolish. Let's get a, an example from the New Testament. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. This is another locus classicus on the classic text on the sovereignty of God. Ephesians chapter 1. Look there, beginning at verse 3. This is the text read in your hearing earlier. And notice in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, that Paul is unfolding the work of God in our redemption. In our redemption. And we'll get into more detail about this in the weeks to come. As Paul unfolds the work of God in our redemption, he insists in the passage several times on pointing us to the end or the purpose of, for which we were redeemed. In other words, the glory of God. All right, several places in the text, this is one long sentence from verse 3 to verse 14. Several times in the text, uh, Paul refers to our redemption being for the glory of God. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, right? Um, look at verse 12, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. He points us to the end or the purpose for which we were redeemed, namely the glory of God. Now, secondly, he insists on pointing us again to the origin or to the source of our redemption, namely the good pleasure of God's own will. God is sovereign even over salvation. We see that in several places throughout the text. Let's read the text together. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Praise the Lord. Just as, here it is, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. That is a crystal clear, unvarnished, unapologetic assertion of God's sovereign election of those who will be saved. He chose us in Christ before anything came about, before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Verse 5, having predestined, in case that wasn't clear enough, he predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. He looked down the corridor of time and foresaw all those who would make, no, no. He predestined us to adoption 
as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to their choice. No, according to the good pleasure of his will, of their decision. No, his will. It's by their faith. No, it's according to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made, he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure. Do you see? God is sovereign. It's according to his good pleasure, according to his good pleasure, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. He purposed it in himself, not according to your good pleasure. He purposed this in himself, that, verse 10, in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. Who's gathering? God is gathering. God's doing the gathering. That he might gather together in one thing, in one, all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, verse 11, being predestined according to our faith. No. Being predestined according to our will. No. Being predestined according to our autonomous choice. No. Being predestined according to the purpose of him who works some things. No. All things. He works all things according to the counsel of our will. No. His will. Do you see? It is inarguable, folks. In Arguable. I don't want to hear, right? frankly, it's, it's absurd to hear that these things are, are shadowy and they're, they're difficult to under... No, they are not. They are difficult to those who are entrenched in ignorance or entrenched in traditionalism or entrenched in defensiveness or entrenched in emotionalism, right? These things are not unclear. We need the faith to go where the word of God leads us along the path of his revelation and to trust him and say, Lord, I, I believe what you reveal. You know, I, and now I got to take a passage like this and I got to go back and how does this fit together with all those passages that I know in scripture that say whosoever will and whosoever will and whosoever and those passages are true also. But we can't neglect we can't slam the door shut on this room and walk out because we don't like what it seems to assert. How many things does God work after the counsel of his own will? All things. Specifically included in the all things of verse 11, he's talking here particularly of all things related to our redemption. All things certainly include kings, certainly includes nations, and here... All things includes our election, our redemption, our adoption, our acceptance. All decrees by God pressed back in time, right? Paul here takes all of those decrees regarding our, our redemption and he pushes them back through the annals of time into the eternal, immutable counsels of the Godhead where God in eternity past before the foundations of the world were laid decreed all things whatsoever that should come to pass. In him you also trusted, verse 13, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. It's fascinating to me that um, particularly with respect to salvation, when someone comes to the understanding that it is God and God alone who freely and sovereignly decrees and elects, predestines those whom will be saved, all of a sudden it wrenches out of the death grip of natural man the ability to say, I have some modicum of control here. There's some things that I can't, I can walk an aisle, I can exercise faith, I can do, I can do this, that, the other thing. I can work. There is something that will earn favor, and I have that within my control. You know what? I'm not dead yet. 
And on my deathbed, I, I can turn to the Lord and say, Lord, please forgive me for all I've done and it's all going to work. Right? No, 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 no. It just, it rips, it wrenches all human sovereignty <laughs> out of your hand. It kills your pride. And I have to turn then to God and say, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Right? Lord, be gracious to me. I don't deserve it. There's absolutely nothing I can do. Lord, I am at your mercy. Look at how I've sinned against you. You are my sovereign ruler. You are my king, my creator. And look at how I've sinned against you. Lord, and there's, there's nothing I can do. I can't save myself. I can't redeem myself. I can't cleanse myself. Lord, you alone can do that. All I can do, Lord, is trust you. All I can do is trust you to cast myself upon you because you've said that you are rich in mercy and abounding in grace. You've said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Right? Learn from me. And so, Lord, I trust you. I trust you. That's faith, right? Amen. That's faith. It's acknowledging that. And that's where a biblical understanding of the sovereignty of God leads. It's the, the, just the, the crushing the crushing of human pride and self-will. And then you can trust that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Why can we trust that? Why can we trust that? Because we serve a sovereign God who in power works all things according to the counsel of His own will. That's why. Jonah chapter 2, verse 9, salvation is of the Lord. Well, very simply put then, what should be our response to this biblical understanding of the sovereignty of God? Isaiah came to understand the sovereignty of God. In chapter 6, we don't have time to go there, but uh, in chapter 6, in closing, Isaiah saw God high and lifted up on his throne, the throne of his sovereign rule. And what was Isaiah's response? What was Isaiah's response, right? Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, the key, the, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew. One cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. And so I said, Woe is me. Right? I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. First response is repentance right? and faith. You notice Isaiah doesn't run screaming for his life. Right? He clings in awe and wonder and in repentance. I am undone. I'm undone. Recognition of his own rebellion, recognition of his own sin, one of the seraphim flew to him, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched his mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, your sin purged. Isaiah trusted the Lord for that forgiveness. That's faith, right? I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And then I said, Here am I. Send me. Flowing from faith flowing from forgiveness, flowing from an acknowledgement of God's sovereign rule over him. <laughs> the second response is Isaiah's willing and fervent service, his devotion to God, fueled by his vision of God's sovereignty. One commentator said this, he said, since God is the true sovereign, there is no greater privilege than to serve him. All before his glory makes other pursuits diminish. Not all are called to the prophetic office. God calls people to be carpenters, lawyers, doctors, sound engineers, and garbage men. But those who have seen the sovereignty of God see all of their labor as an opportunity to extend his reign and serve his kingdom. You see that, right? It's when we realize how great is the God we serve, how total is his sovereignty over all, and how glorious is his kingdom 
that we want to serve him in all we do. Isaiah had not even learned what labor God had in mind for him. But when he heard the question, whom shall I send? His newly consecrated lips broke forth. Here am I, send me. If we see just a portion of what he saw, we will do the same. Considering not the difficulties, but the high privilege of serving so great a Lord. It's a difficult ministry in, for Isaiah. In chapter 9, the Lord said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull. Make their ears, their ears heavy. Shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. It's a tough calling, right? Then I said, Isaiah said, Lord, how long? Doesn't question um, whether he should. What's the point? He doesn't respond with, right? What's the point then? Why, why are you doing that? God doesn't do that. It's just obedience, okay? How long should I do that for? And how long, how long should I do that for? The third response of Isaiah is humble and trusting obedience to God's commands, even in the midst of difficult, difficult ministry. God answered him, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant, until the houses are without a man, the land is utterly desolate. The Lord, sovereign Lord, has removed men far away. Forsaken places are many in the midst of the land, but yet a tenth will be in it, a remnant, right? Will return to be for consuming as a terebinth tree or as an oak whose stump remains when it is cut down. So the holy seed shall be its stump. God has decreed. A remnant God has decreed is Messiah, a promised Messiah through whom he will save the world from their sins, save his people from their sins. And Isaiah proclaims him. Paul comes to an understanding of the sovereignty of God, the sovereignty of God over all things, even over salvation. And he responds this way in Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. All praise, honor, and glory to our sovereign Lord. Let's pray together. Let's take a few moments now considering the sovereignty of God. Uh, consider your place under his sovereign rule. How are you doing as a faithful, devoted servant of the Lord? If you're, not, if you're here today and you've not been saved, um, submit now in repentance and faith to this sovereign king. Brothers and sisters, if you, you professing him as Lord, uh, let's follow him with all our hearts. Amen. Let's pray. And we'll pray together and you'll be dismissed. Our sovereign Lord, our King, Lord, we pray to you. And now, Lord, that you would, for the glory of your own name, you would gather in all of your elect. Gather your people Lord, and convert sinners. I pray, Lord, that you would take those who are yours, and through your word, by your spirit, make them a chaste virgin, um, ready for her bride, her bridegroom, and prepare us, Lord, for that day. We need you, Lord, to do this. Please, Lord, um, work in us according to your good will, according to your good pleasure. Have your way with us, Lord, we pray for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, for the glory of your name. We pray all these things in his name. Amen.